Welcome to the seminar in honor of Anthony P. Triolo. This is section two. It's about the development, economic development. It, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, I'll just make a, a rollover in my uh, in, in my voice. Uh, to try to make two important uh, points. Uh, first of all, this is a wonderful opportunity to express our gratitude to Professor Anthony Phillips Hirwal for allow us that uh, the first edition of the International Development a seminar uh, we are organizing, Hall just uh, his name. Uh, his name actually is made uh, in the in the in the vertice, in the conjunction of uh, two important disciplines: economic development and economic growth quite uh, important issues uh, are becoming particular, particularly uh, after uh, uh, we are uh, looking uh, the, the exit of the pandemia and they will become even, even more important for our countries. But uh, obviously, uh, Professor Thirwal as uh, Professor uh, uh, Perrotini Hernandez will uh, uh, say, uh, his name is made uh, just in the conjunction of uh, the two subjects, the two disciplines uh, quoted by me uh, through uh, many, many papers. Uh, I like to, to, to mention uh, outstandingly his book about uh, uh, economic development. One of the book uh, many of us has studied in Latin America, in Mexico in specific, but uh, many people uh, uh, concern about uh, economic development and economic growth is reading. Uh, I, I, I guess the seventh or the eighth edition of the book I quoted, I quoted already. Well, thank you very much for uh, that distinction to our seminar, uh, allowing us, uh, uh, I repeat, to hold uh, your name uh, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this version in English. The second, and uh, the last uh, uh, point I like to make is to inform, um, if uh, that is necessary, that this is the, the second uh, uh, edition of our seminar, the first in English, but we had already uh, uh, one in, in, in Spanish, uh, obviously, uh, addressed by many people, many scholars uh, doing research on economic development. And uh, uh, we dedicated, because uh, 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 Professor Jaime Ross uh, passed away uh, uh, closely two years ago, uh, we devote uh, uh, to him uh, and the name of our seminar in Spanish, because uh, uh, we in Mexico are uh, quite uh, familiarized uh, with uh, two central books written by Professor Ross. I refer to Development Theory and the Economics of Growth, released in, in in just in the year uh, uh, 2000, and uh, uh, the 
um, uh, the new book uh, in, in somehow the continuation of uh, the issues uh, uh, touch in 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 twenty in two in two thousands year uh, called rethinking economic development growth and institution in release in uh, uh, two o uh, thirteen published by Oxford University Press. And what, what is special in these two books? Well, in, 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 two, in, in the first book, uh, he defines uh, the book, colloquially speaking, has uh, one collection of essays trespassing between two disciplines. Uh, uh, in this case, economic growth and economic development. And he called, he, he called them uh, colloquially uh, 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 trespassing because uh, he saw the need of, uh, of doing that uh, because uh, uh, given the lack of uh, interaction between the two fields, economic development and economic growth. But uh, in, the new, in the new book, I mean, in rethinking economic development, uh, etc., cetera, uh, he said, uh, there are some new um, approaches coming out which uh, uh, he celebrate because uh, uh, he thought, and the book is the best testimony about what I'm saying, that uh, they, uh, uh, that kind of, of approaches uh, signalize uh, that uh, uh, two subjects, which uh, uh, he defined as a causing distant causings, I mean, two divergent uh, uh, field of, uh, of economic uh, uh, thought. Uh, there uh, uh, a lot of effort in order to uh, convert, uh, to make them to converge. What kind of approaches, uh, uh, dear Professor uh, Thirwell, uh, he visualized in, in his book, for instance, approaches uh, such as social infrastructure, the development, the developmental effect of the natural resources, abundance, advantage and disadvantage all uh, at the same time. The, ge the geographic and uh, 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 the advantage and the disadvantages they present for many for many countries. And a specific mention uh, he devoted to the expanding literature on institutional uh, explanation about uh, uh, development issues. Uh, and he celebrated, he was very happy about uh, these approaches in so short period, considering the overall period economic develop, development has evolved, uh, 20, uh, 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 practically one decade and a half. He celebrate for one reason. Uh, he said, because they allow us to understand cross country differences in income per capita. And the income per capita, which uh, 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 is interacted for, for proximate uh, uh, factor, but also for uh, some kind of uh, deep determinant as the geography, as the institution, for instance, uh, uh, he saw, uh, uh, to summarize, uh, these um, approaches uh, uh, 
uh, focusing uh, uh, per capita income because it is uh, uh, income per capita major factor explaining difference differences in growth performance across countries. So uh, with uh, the expectation to hear uh, uh, about uh, this kind of issues or additional issues is the main reason uh, why apart from uh, your very well known uh, uh, academic name you hold, Professor Thirwell, the other reason why we uh, enthusiastically, very happily uh, uh, embrace uh, the development of these conferences. Many thanks. Thank you, Speaker. Dr. Pachotin, any words? Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Idio, for, for, for letting me to to speak a bit. So I, I wouldn't like to waste uh, your time, you know, uh, uh, with a long conversation, uh, because I think we are, are, are all anxious to, uh, to, to listen to Professor Sonne Thurwell and what he has to say about uh, 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 his talk for today. So I, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, begin with, to thank uh, Professor Anthony Thurwell uh, for, for uh, accepting to uh, be a part of our seminar. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Thurwell uh, needs uh, no introduction at all. I mean, he, he hardly needs to be introduced. He, his name is uh, worldwide known. His work has been translated into uh, several languages. Uh, into Spanish, to be sure, of course. Uh, so he's very well known. In particular, he is very well known in our university. Uh, so Tony, uh, welcome, welcome back to ULAM, because uh, you have been a, a, a very close friend uh, to us, to our university, for 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 a very long time. And uh, and like I said, uh, Professor Thewell uh, doesn't know much of an introduction. Uh, his work is very well known, and um, I wouldn't like to take more time. So uh, Tony is also a member of uh, the uh, editorial board of uh, Investigación Económica. He's a distinguished member of uh, the editorial board of Investigación Económica. And with his talk, we are also celebrating the 80th anniversary of Investigación Económica. And for that reason, I am really grateful for uh, uh, his contribution uh, to uh, the field, his contribution to uh, the journal, and his contribution to our seminar. So, uh, Tony, the floor is yours. And uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, being a part of our celebration. Okay, uh, thank you, Benjamin, and thank you, Ignacio, for your kind words of introduction. So, buenas tardes a todos. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the limits of my Spanish. <laughs> ha hello, everyone. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for logging in to listen to this uh, seminar. Uh, I hope you're all safe and well at this difficult time, wherever you, you may be. And if you're curious where I am located, I'm in my study in my house in Canterbury, which is in the southeast corner of uh, England. And when I look out of my window here, I see uh, Canterbury Cathedral, which is the mother church of the, the Church of England. And that always gives me a lot of uh, inspiration. So thank you, uh, Ignacio, for inviting me to participate in this uh, seminar program. I'm, I'm really grateful. And also congratulations to Investigación Economica on its 80th birthday. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that the journal is the oldest economics journal in uh, Latin America, and it's certainly one of the most uh, prestigious. Uh, this 80th birthday of the journal happens to coincide with my own 80th year. Congratulations. 
<laughs> and in fact, I had this wicked idea that Ignazio may have invited me to this seminar program uh, because I'm an economist with the same age as the journal. No, I'm, I'm joking, Ignazio. But what I should what <laughs> what I should have what I should have told you <clears throat> is that my actual birthday is in two weeks' time on the 21st of April. So if we'd have had the seminar in two weeks' time on the 21st, we could have had a party as well. And we could have drunk champagne or more champagne, as Keynes might have said, because when Keynes was asked what he would have done differently in life, he said, drink more champagne. So Keynes, you know, was a bon viveur as well as um, a great economist. And please, incidentally, please, hmm? please accept a canon uh, shot from Mexico, because uh, your birthday, uh, so far I know, coincide with the uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth birthday? She's, she's 95. And no, 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 in terms of years. In terms 95, of 95 she will be on the 21st of April. But even more significant, it's the 75th anniversary of the death of John Maynard Keynes. Okay. On the 21st of April, 1946, when he was only 63 years old. So can, we can remember him too as the the person who revolutionized uh, macroeconomics, macroeconomic uh, theory. Uh, I'm not a stranger uh, to UNAM. I was actually at UNAM physically in person at the 70th birthday, if you remember, Ignacio? Yes, I do. I do that in 2011. And my first visit to UNAM was way back in the year 2000 when I gave a series of lectures on non-orthodox theories of economic growth, which was published as a book. And uh, Ignacio kindly translated it with the title La Naturalenza del Crescimento Economico. I think my pronunciation is not very good, but it's I'm great. really grateful to Ignacio for making my ideas uh, accessible to uh, Spanish-speaking students in, in, in Spanish-speaking countries. Okay, so uh, today I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm not going to give a technical uh, research paper. Rather, what I'm going to do is firstly to talk about the challenge of reducing world poverty and divisions in the world economy between uh, rich and poor countries. And then secondly, I'm going to discuss the work and ideas of four well-known growth and, and development theorists that have um, inspired my thinking and writing uh, over the years. And they are Arthur Lewis, uh, Amartya Sen, Nicholas Caldor and Joseph Stieglitz. You will all have heard of these uh, economists, I am sure. And this is why I've called my uh, presentation in praise of uh, development economics. because it highlights uh, the focus of development economics on the roots of underdevelopment, the roots of poverty, and economists that uh, the subject has uh, attracted um, over the years. So now I'm gonna talk um, to the students listening because what I want to say is that um, I don't know what your career plans are that you have in, have in mind, but when I meet my own development students, I tell them that the, a course in development economics, particularly a master's course in development economics, is a preparation for many exciting and uh, interesting opportunities to work in the field of economic uh, development. 
And they include, for example, United Nations agencies that use development economists. I'm thinking of UNCTAD in uh, Geneva, UNIDO in Vienna, the ILO in Geneva, the UNDP in New York with offices in countries all over the world, ECLAC in uh, Latin America. And then secondly, a, a master's program in development is preparation for a PhD work, which then may lead on to entry into say the World Bank and the IMF, which have these young professionals programs and also into university teaching if you're so inclined. And then there's work for NGOs, non-governmental organizations that use development economists. And then uh, consultancies that work in developing countries and government ministries concerned with uh, economic development. So there's lots of, lots of interesting opportunities out there for students who, who graduate with a, a master's say, degree in, in development economics. Also, when I start my own course on uh, economic development, I say to the students that I think that the, the economic and social development of uh, poor countries in the world is one of the, the greatest challenges facing mankind at the present time. And I'm interested in the contribution that economics can make to an understanding of why some countries are rich and others are, are poor and how to raise the, the living standards of poor people in poor countries. And the existence of extreme poverty isn't only a, a moral issue, one, one might say an issue of uh, justice, also a practical issue because poverty breeds so many ne negative externalities to the world as a whole. I'm thinking of violence, uh, terrorism, crime, international migration, the spread of disease, negative environmental externalities, and so on. And they're all linked uh, to poverty. So it's in the self-interest, to put it another way, it's in the self-interest of richer developed countries to be concerned with the plight of poorer nations, even more so now with the, 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 the COVID pandemic. Now I've mentioned Keynes, but the great uh, British economist, John Maynard Keynes once said that what drew him to economics as a subject was its intellectual rigor combined with its potentiality for good, with the emphasis on, on potentiality for good. Now he was concerned, of course, with the waste of mass unemployment in the 1920s and the 1930s, but he always treated economics as a moral science, a moral science as a branch of ethics. In the Cambridge tradition, of uh, Alfred Marshall, Arthur Pigou, uh, Dennis Robertson, and so on. Certainly uh, not as a branch of mathematics, which is the way much of economics is treated today almost as a game. Even though Keynes himself was a trained mathematician and also Alfred Marshall, but they use very, very little maths in their, their major works. So I think that studying and, and practicing uh, development economics is a wonderful way of treating economics as a moral science. And I think it's very interesting that many of the world's uh -huh. top economists in the past and, and present have been attracted to the study of um, development economics. Now I'm gonna give you some names here of people from the past, who've turned their minds to the issue of uh, development. I'm very conscious that I've missed out from the past for Tado, and I apologize for that. And I, I apologize for any other omissions that you can may find in this <laughs> list from the past and from the, the, the present. But from the present, you have these um, very distinguished uh, names that all write in the development field. 
the list is like a who's who in economics, uh, one might say. And I'm sure that you will have studied, the students here will have studied uh, the ideas of some of these great names in the, in the field. And later, uh, as I said uh, a moment ago, I'm going to say a few words about four growth and development economists that have inspired me over the years. But first I want to remind you of the extent of poverty in the world and the economic divisions that exist in the world between rich and poor countries, which is the challenge facing uh, development economics and development e economists. So here I've got a slide which uh, gives you figures on levels of poverty and poverty rate, where poverty is measured as living on less than $1.9 a day at 2011 uh, PPP. The significance of the 1990 figure here is that this was the standard set when the uh, Millennium Development Goals were announced in the year uh, 2000. And the objective was to halve the poverty rate by 2015 compared with its uh, rate in 1990. So what you have here in 1990 is uh, nearly 2 billion people living on less than $1.9 uh, a day with a poverty rate, that is uh, the percent of population, at 37.1%. Uh, so what's half of 37.1? It's about uh, 70, 80. Uh, the target would be to get that rate down to 18, just 18 and a half percent by 2015. Well, that was achieved globally. And you can see in 2018 here, it's down to 10. Uh, Point one, but it wasn't achieved in uh, every developing country in the world, far from it. And uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the target was uh, way off. Well, you do see uh, between 1990 and 2018, a reduction in the numbers of people in poverty from nearly 2 billion down to 827. But you see that most of that, virtually all of that, is a reduction in poverty in East Asia and the Pacific, including China. And if you look at other regions of the, of the world, and particularly uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, you find in Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers living in absolute poverty below $1.9 a day has increased from 288 million to 433. And the poverty rate there is still over 40%. Uh, uh, percent. Now, the Millennium Development Goals were superseded by what were called the Sustainable Development Goals. They were announced in 2015. And the first Sustainable Development Goal is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere by the year 2030. Now, no one believes that this is achievable globally. You're not going to eliminate poverty, absolute poverty, uh, globally. But a 1% poverty rate may be achievable in some countries, depending on the growth of the per capita income of the country and what we call the elasticity of the poverty rate with respect to growth. But certainly not in sub-Saharan Africa, or for that matter, uh, Southeast, uh, South Asia. And the present COVID pandemic is making, of course, the situation worse, much worse. It's estimated that the effect of the pandemic will push at least uh, another 150 million extra people into poverty below the $1.9 a day threshold. So that would take the figure again for the absolute level of world poverty over 1 billion. So I would say that the challenge of reducing world poverty is still enormous. And in any case, I think that the, the poverty line of $1.9 a day is a very low benchmark. 
I think that the United Nations and the sustainable development goals should have been much more uh, ambitious. For example, if $5 a day was the benchmark, which is still very low, nearly half of humanity would be living uh, below this uh, level of, uh, of $5 a day. Over, over 3 billion would be living uh, below that level. So, you know, for life, uh, for many people in developing countries is still what Thomas Hobbes called uh, in the 17th century, uh, nasty, brutish, and short. Nasty, brutish, and short. Now, there are, of course, some rich people in poor countries, and there are rich countries where no one lives on less than $1.9 a day, or even on less than $5 a day, which brings me to this uh, topic of divisions in the world economy, that is inequality um, across the world. Well, as economists know, there are several different measures of income distribution, but the one most commonly used is the so-called Gini ratio of international inequality and global inequality. Now, international inequality takes the average income of each uh, country, regardless of the distribution of income within a country, whereas global inequality takes account of income inequality, not only between countries, but also within countries based on household survey data. Now, I, I give you a table here of international inequality and global or world inequality uh, from, from, from various sources. International inequality, unweighted and population weighted. So first of all, um, economic historians, they've gone back as, as, as far as they, they, they reasonably can, back to 1820. And you see there that the international Gini ratio unweighted was really quite low, uh, 0 0.2. You know, virtually every country was poor. <laughs> we, were, we were all poor. Um, but what you see is that over time, that degree of international inequality has increased considerably. And now the latest, I'm sorry, I haven't got a, a more updated figure than the 2013. But you see here that it's risen virtually threefold up to well, a maximum there of in 2002, uh, 0 0.58. It's been stabilizing a bit uh, in the last um, a decade or two because of the quite rapid growth of two very poor countries, uh, India and, uh, and China. But a degree of inequality which is higher than the degree of internal inequality within most, most countries. Well, now uh, look on the right uh, for uh, global inequality. You see that back in 1820, there was uh, a high degree of global inequality al already. Why? Because of uh, a high degree of internal inequality where you know, the vast majority of people in the countries were very, very poor, but you had landowners and monarchs and sultans or, you know, whatever you call them, uh, barons with vast wealth and vast income. And you see that uh, degree of, of global inequality increasing uh, slightly. But the, the noticeable thing is that whereas the, in, back in 1820, the international inequality accounted for only two fifths of global inequality. Today, uh, the international inequality accounts for um, um, just under five sixths of, um, of global inequality. So the, 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 the inequality issue is much more an issue of divisions between countries than it is um, uh, within countries. Well, on this score, um, my own view is that one shouldn't be afraid 
uh, to make normative statements in economics. You know, some people say that making normative statements uh, undermines the science of economics. But I've got some figures, or quotes rather, here that I entirely agree with. A quote here from Kushik Basu, who was the chief economist of the, of the World Bank some years ago, where he says here that the hiatus between the richest and the poorest people is too large and the extent of poverty on earth is unacceptable. I like to believe that there will come a time when looking back at today's world, human beings will wonder how primitive we were that we tolerated this. And there, here's a quote from the UNDP, United Nations Development Programme, in one of its uh, human development reports, describing the world as gargantian in its excesses and grotesque in its inequalities. And I've got a couple of other statistics there, there below, which might be of interest. The richest 1% of people in the world receive as much income as the bottom 60%. The total income of the 25 million richest Americans is equal to the total income of 2 billion of the world's uh, poorest uh, people. Well, here's a, here's a, a, a question to students. Uh, have any of your teachers asked you the John Rawls question of behind a veil of ignorance, what sort of society would you prefer to be born into? A world in which a, a billion struggle on less than $1.9 a day and three billion on less than $5 a day with say only a 10% chance of leading a, um, a comfortable lifestyle or into a fairer world that provides a decent living standard for everyone, wherever they're born in whatever the richest country is, Norway, I think, um, or uh, the poorest uh, Burundi. Well, when I ask uh, my students this question, they always choose the latter alternative. And I'm sure you would do too. But the point is that we still live in a world of vast divisions not only in income, in per capita income, but also in access to things like healthcare, to education, and other basic amenities, which impact on the quality of life. Okay, so now I want to turn to uh, what I call my um, heroes in development uh, economics. Uh, as you'll probably know already, and development economics is really as old as economics itself because you know all the great classical economists of Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, uh, David Ricardo, uh, Karl Marx were all concerned with the progress of, of nations and the distribution of income, uh, the distribution of income particularly between wages and profits. But it wasn't until after the Second World War really um, that development economics as a, a distinct subject within economics was uh, born. And there were many pioneers that you'll have heard of, including Paul Rosenstein, Rodin, uh, Ragnar Nurkse, Raul Prebisch, Hans Singer, Gunnar Myrdal, um, Arthur Lewis, uh, to name but a few. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, uh, we all need heroes in life. Uh, some people have sports stars, some people have pop stars, some have literary figures, but I've picked out four development economists uh, who have inspired me over the years and made important contributions to our understanding of the growth and, and development process and how economic and social development should be defined. And they are, I mentioned already, two are dead, uh, two are alive. Arthur Lewis, uh, dead. Nicholas Caldor, dead. Amartya Sen, alive. And Joseph Stieglitz, alive. Is there uh, the, the years of their Nobel Prizes? Uh, my first hero is um, Arthur Lewis. 
let me tell you a bit about uh, Arthur Lewis. He, he was born on the Caribbean island of St. Lucia in uh, 1915. When he came to, to England to the London School of Economics as a student uh, in 1933, he excelled as a student and he was appointed to the staff of the London School of Economics in 1938 and he stayed there to 1948. Um, while he was applying for promotion from, from lecturer uh, to a more senior position, both in the LSC and other universities, he suffered a lot of racial discrimination. And you can read about that in the, a biography of Arthur Lewis by uh, Tietnor at, uh, at Princeton University. But eventually he was appointed to a chair as a professor at the University of Manchester in 1948. He stayed there till 1958, became vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies in 1958 to 1963. He then went to Princeton University in 1963, stayed there till 1970, when he was appointed to the presidency of the Caribbean uh, Development Bank. And then he won the Nobel Prize for economics in 1979 for his work in uh, development economics. So he's regarded as one of the so-called fathers of development economics for his famous paper, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, which was published in the Manchester School in 1954, and for his book, The Theory of Economic Growth, published in 1950, Five, which is one of the first textbooks on development economics. Now, I have to say to the students, if you haven't read Arthur Lewis's paper of 1954, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, you can't call yourself a development economist. And for your interest, I have a, a signed copy. Can you see that? Of his paper? signed yes. by Lewis himself, yes. Caldor uh, gave me. And when I take my classes in development economics, I say to the students, you can touch this signature for a pound. Uh, not, many, <laughs> not many students do, presumably because the, the price is greater than the marginal utility, but for you, it would be 25 pesos. Would you, would you touch it? No, maybe not. Anyway. Um, let me say a little bit about the model. Uh, the model that he outlined over 60 years ago now is, in my view, still as relevant uh, today as it ever was, because what it is, it's the representation of a process which went on historically and still goes on today of an emerging, uh, what he called capitalist or industrial sector, absorbing surplus labor from what he called an indigenous subsistence sector at a fixed low wage, enabling the investment of more and more profit until surplus labor dries up. Wages then start to rise because the two sectors compete with each other for the labor, eating into the capitalist profit. And there's a very nice, uh, famous quote within the paper where he asks, Lewis asks rhetorically, if we ask why developing countries save so little, the answer is not because they're so poor, but because their capitalist sector is so small. So what he's getting at here is that most saving and investment comes out of the retained earnings, the profits of, 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 of business. It doesn't come from the the personal sector. In the case of China, it comes from the income of state enterprises. And that's one of the reasons why the savings and investment rate is so high in China that none of the profits is distributed to shareholders. So it's, uh, uh, it's profits that provide the, the saving and uh, in investment. And today the model explains the fast growth of some of the the so-called NICs, the newly industrializing countries in Southeast Asia, 
where cheap labor is combined with modern technology uh, and enables countries to compete favorably in world markets and enjoy the rapid growth of uh, exports. If you can combine cheap labor with modern technology, it's a, a, a lethal combination with which to compete in, in world trade. Well, there's now, in the, if you read the literature, there's now a big debate in the literature on the question of the, uh, what's called the Lewis turning point. That is when the elastic supply of labor dries up, because when it does, uh, rising wages eats into profits, capital accumulation will slow down, and therefore uh, economic growth. So the message from that is that the NICs won't go on growing so fast forever. And some people talk about these countries then getting into a middle income trap, but I won't talk about uh, that uh, any, anymore this afternoon. The, pol the policy message of the model is that economic and social development must involve a structural transformation of an economy out of low productivity subsistence agriculture and petty services into activities with higher productivity and faster growth prospects. So we are talking about manufacturing, sophisticated services, uh, maybe tourism. Well, I never met Lewis personally, I wish I had have done, but in 2014, I made a pilgrimage to St. Lucia to see his grave, which is on the top of a hill inside a community college, which is named after him, and also to see the bust of him in the central square of Castries, the, the capital of uh, St. Lucia. And I was very moved. And St. Lucia is very proud of him, along with their other Nobel laureate, uh, Derek Walcott, uh, the poet. So St. Lucia has a, a very small uh, population, but it has two Nobel laureates. And in fact, if you do the maths, they have the highest ratio of Nobel laureates to population of any country in the world. If you go to quizzes, uh, that is the answer to the question, which country has the most Nobel laureates per head of population? Okay, my second um, hero is um, Amartya Sen. Now, I don't know what your view is, but my view is that Amartya Sen is the greatest living uh, development uh, economist. He was born in India in 1933, came to Cambridge as a student in the early 1950s. And during his long career, he's been a professor of economics at Delhi University, the London School of Economics, Oxford, Cambridge, and now in his late 80s is still active at uh, Harvard University in the United States. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1998 for his work on the interface between uh, development economics and, and, and welfare. Now he's made major contributions to virtually every branch of development economics from his early work on the choice of techniques and social cost benefit analysis to his analysis of famines. But in my view, his real importance is that he's changed the way economic, eco economists think about the meaning and the, the process of uh, economic development. In his important book, Poverty and uh, Famines, which was published in 1981, and then in his 1983 paper, Development uh, Which Way Now, he criticizes the use of uh, aggregate measures of gross domestic product and the growth of per capita income in a country as a measure of development, because it says nothing about the distribution of income within a, in a, within a country and the what he calls the entitlements and capabilities uh, that people have. So for most people, uh, uh, what do entitlements depend on? Well, they depend on the uh, 
the ability, their ability to, to sell labor and the prices of commodities they, that they buy. But it's not only income that determines entitlements, but also such factors as what the power relations are in a society, the, the spatial distribution of resources within an economy, such as uh, schools and healthcare, and what individuals can extract from the state. So I give on the slide here Sen's definition of entitlements, the set of alternative commodity bundles that a person can command in society using the totality of rights and obligations that he or she faces. And then entitlements generate the capabilities to do certain things, which Sen calls the, the, the combination of functionings that people can achieve. Capabilities then give freedom, which for Sen is the primary objective of economic and social development, which he uh, uh, discusses at length in his uh, 1999 book, uh, Development as uh, Freedom. So for Sen, what development means is the removal of various types of unfreedoms including famine and undernourishment, poor health and education, lack of basic needs, lack of political liberty, and basic uh, civil rights. And none of these are captured by the growth of per capita income itself. Now, these ideas of uh, SEN have been enormously influential within the international development community and can be seen in for example, the World Development for 2000-2001, the World Development Report uh, called Attacking Poverty, which was devoted to the topic of how to expand the entitlements, capabilities and freedom of poor people. And it was also the work of uh, Amartya Sen with his friend Marvel Hack that lay behind the construction of the Human Development Index which was first published by the UNDP in its Human Development Report in 1990, which moves away from using uh, per capita income as a single measure of development to include uh, things like life expectancy, uh, educational uh, attainment, and so on. And if you do the ranking of countries by uh, per capita income and the, uh, by the HDP, the Human Development Index, you can get a very different ranking. You can find countries which are high on the income per capita scale, but low on HDI. You can find countries which are poor on the per capita income scale, but high on the human development uh, index. Also, his ideas lie behind what is called the multi-dimensional uh, development index which is constructed in Oxford and also is published. It's much more complex, but also published in the, uh, in the Human Development Report of the, of the UNDP. Now, my third hero is Nicholas Caldor. I've, I've, I've got a vested interest in introducing Caldor to you because I knew him, him well, very well for 10 years before he died in 1986, and uh, I published a biography of him, uh, an academic uh, biography of him in uh, 1987. The, the Economist uh, newspaper uh, once described him as the best uh, known economist in the world not to have received uh, the Nobel uh, uh, Prize. The Nobel Prize is a partly political prize as, as well as a purely economic prize. Now let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Nicholas Calder. He was born in Hungary in 1908, came to England in 1927 to study at the, the LSE, rather like uh, Arthur Lewis did. Um, he had an interesting and colourful life, uh, not only as an economist, but also politically, because he was uh, very much associated with the, uh, the Labour Party in the, uh, in the United Kingdom and held various advisory positions with them in, uh, in government. 
Well, he excelled as a student and uh, as a result was appointed to the staff of the LSE in 1932, where he made fundamental theoretical contributions to various branches of uh, economics, including the theory of the firm, to capital theory, to trade cycle theory, to welfare economics, and to the, the Keynesian uh, revolution. In fact, he was one of the first economists at the London School of Economics to be converted to the Keynesian revolution. And um, after uh, Caldor had published a paper in 1939 entitled Speculation and Economic Stability, Sir John Hicks wrote to him and said, your uh, 1939 paper is the culmination of the Keynesian revolution in theory. You ought to have had more honor for it, which I thought was a very nice uh, accolade from uh, Sir John Hicks, a Nobel Prize winner uh, later on um, himself. Well, in, during the war in, 19, in the 1940s, he, he had a lot of discussion with, with Keynes on um, war finance and national income accounting. Uh, in 1947, he, he left the LSE to go to Geneva as the director of research at the Economic Commission for Europe, headed by uh, Gunnar Myrtle. He stayed there till um, uh, 1949, 1950, when he moved to Cambridge as a fellow of King's College in the footsteps of Keynes, uh, one might say, and he spent the rest of his uh, academic life there as a fellow of King's. He was, well, you'll know this already, but uh, he was the joint architect along with um, Joan Robinson, uh, Richard Kahn, uh, Luigi Pazanetti of what we call post Keynesian growth and distribution theory as a counterweight to neoclassical growth and distribution theory emanating from the, uh, the pens of uh, Paul Samuelson, uh, Robert Solo, Frank, Franco Modigliani at uh, MIT in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Well, in the, then in the 1960s, when he was also economic advisor to the Labour government between 1964 and 1970, he turned his attention away from uh, a pure theory to the applied economics of growth and why growth rates differ between countries. And he's important because he was the first uh, to put forward a structural explanation of development and why growth rates differ between countries in contrast to the aggregate uh, one good approach of orthodox neoclassical growth theory, which basically ignores structure because it's a one good model and we, which makes so many uh, unrealistic assumptions such as the labor force and technical progress grow at a, a constant exogenous rate, that investment always equals saving, that factor supplies are exogenous, that there are diminishing returns to capital so that investment doesn't matter for long run growth and so on. Well, uh, I just asked the question how this model ever became the workhorse of growth economics will always remain a mystery to me, uh, but that of course is, a, is another uh, story. Calder al always uh, argued that it's not possible to uh, understand divisions in, in the world economy without making this fundamental distinction between land-based activities uh, 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 subject to diminishing returns on the, on the one hand and manufacturing industry subject to increasing returns on, on the other. That poor countries tend to specialize in the former and rich countries in the latter. And this makes a huge difference to levels of productivity, uh, to levels of per capita income and to growth performance of these countries. Uh, primary products, uh, uh, products from, from land-based activities and manufactured goods also have different demand characteristics, but primary products have a, in general, an income elasticity of demand less than one, which we call Engel's law, 
while manufacturers have an income elasticity of greater than one. And this makes a big difference to how fast these commodities grow in world trade, and of course, to the balance of payments of, of rich and poor countries. Well, Caldor's views have become known in the literature as Caldor's uh, growth laws. And there are three um, uh, that are tested. The first law is the simple law that manufacturing is indeed the, the engine of growth. So you can do cross-section, you can do panel analysis, you can make side tests to overcome the problem of a sparrow relationship because part of GDP growth is manufacturing. So you can test uh, uh, GDP growth on the excess of manufacturing growth on non-manufacturing growth. Uh, why is manufacturing uh, the engine of growth? Because manufacturing is subject to increasing returns. So the second law is that manufacturing productivity growth is positive related to manufacturing output growth, called in the literature of Verdun's law because of static and dynamic returns to scale in, um, in manufacturing. And then the third law is uh, that non-manufacturing productivity growth is positive related to manufacturing output growth because in non-manufacturing, if there are diminishing returns, the marginal product of labor is less than the average product. So that as labor is drawn into manufacturing, productivity rises in non-manufacturing uh, automatically. These laws now have uh, been extensively tested and are supported um, empirically. And the policy message for poor countries is then structural change. Out of low productivity agriculture into, into manufacturing. The policy challenge is how to bring about structural change. In other words, uh, questions arise, what is the role of the state in this business? What is the role of protection? If protection, what type of protection? Ajit Singh, uh, a development economist at Cambridge, alas, uh, died recently, once said to me that as a student in Cambridge, Caldor taught him three things. Firstly, poor countries must industrialize. Secondly, the only way they can industrialize is through protection. Anyone who says otherwise is being dishonest. Now, my fourth hero is Joseph Stieglitz, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2001. He was born in Gary, Indiana in the United States in 1943, the same town, incidentally, that uh, Paul Samuelson was uh, born in. So the two of the most prolific economists of the 20th century were both born in the same town of Gary, Indiana. I think there must be something in the water there. But anyway, he's certainly the most prolific economist <coughs> now of his generation. Uh, his contributions um, cover virtually every branch of economics, including development economics. But the reason I admire Stieglitz is because he's not only a first-rate economic theorist, but he's also interested in the real world. And he's used his eminence to champion poor countries in a globalized world in two powerful books. Uh, one was called Globalization and Its Discontents, which was published in 2002. And the second was Making Globalization Work, published in 2004. Uh, let me remind you, he was the chief economist of the World Bank between 1997 and 2000, but he resigned because he disagreed very much with the content of so-called structural adjustment programs and conditionality, which are imposed on poor countries by the World Bank and the IMF as a condition of loan support. And there was this big bust up or rift between him and Ken Rogoff, who was the chief economist at the IMF at the time. His book, 
Globalization and Its Discontents, published in 2002, satirizes the IMF by describing what he calls a four-step program for every country, regardless of, uh, regardless of circumstances, and already pre-drafted by the IMF officials before they reach the country for what they refer to as voluntary signature by the country concerned. Well, voluntary, in fact, means no signature, uh, no help. And the four key components of each program are the freeing up of trade, trade liberalization, market-based pricing, taking subsidies of uh, goods, capital market liberalization, free movement of capital, and the privatization of state enterprises. Now, all these policies have usually been disastrous when they've been uh, applied. And I can speak from personal experience because I was in the University of Khartoum in the Sudan in 1979 when an IMF program was uh, applied. And well, one could, would have, could have predicted what the consequences were because the IMF insisted that the subsidy on sugar should be taken off. Now, anyone who knew the Sudan would know that the Sudan have the sweetest tooth in the world because they have, a, a, they have the sweetest tooth in the world Where's my, uh, where's my slide gone? My slide has gone somewhere. I don't know why it's disappeared. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't need it really. Move, move back one. So move if you move quick. forward, you, you will get it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that. But I was saying that I was in this Sudan in 1979, when an IMF program was uh, applied, they insisted on taking off the subsidy on sugar. The Sudanese have the sweetest tooth in the world because they have a drink called kakade, which is only palatable if you put about four spoonfuls of sugar in. Well, the subsidy on sugar was taken off. There were riots in the streets. There were riots on the campus of the University of Khartoum and seven students were shot. Now, this is just one example of IMF riots, which have been experienced in many countries in the past where these IMF programs have been uh, applied. Stieglitz particularly attacks the doctrine of free trade at any price, which is uh, not only the policy of course of the World Bank and the IMF, but it's also the philosophy of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And I myself have had a, a long-standing interest in the consequences of free trade for uh, development and published a book in 2008, 2008, which was entitled Trade Liberalization and the Poverty of Nations with my colleague and wife, Penelope Pacheco Lopez, a graduate of uh, UNAM, incidentally, with uh, the overall conclusion that free trade has not delivered the promises expected. There's, there's a, a divorce between the rhetoric of free trade, if you like, and the, and the reality, and that some form of infant industry protection is required if structural change is to be brought about. And the balance of payments protected, incidentally, because what tends to happen is that uh, the sequencing of liberalization isn't thought about carefully. Uh, imports surge immediately when trade barriers are removed, but it takes time for exports to, to respond. So the countries go into balance of payments crisis. Well, uh, if you read Stiglitz, he goes further and argues for infant country protection. That countries just generally should uh, protect themselves. But protection doesn't necessarily mean tariffs and quotas. It could be subsidies, or it could be selective credit to innovators, as argued by uh, Ricardo Hausmann and Danny Roderick, for example, in their important work on self-discovery, how a countries can acquire new comparative advantage by protecting the innovators in a particular field. 
So to conclude, to conclude my talk um, entitled uh, uh, In Praise of Development Economics, yeah, uh, I, I would say, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's really the only branch of uh, economics that addresses the moral imperative of understanding the roots of poverty and the development of roots of poverty in the world and the ways of uh, reducing it. And at the same time, allows economists to treat economics as a moral science, as a branch of ethics, as uh, Keynes, uh, Marshall, Pico um, viewed it. In the 1980s, there was talk about the death, I don't remember any of you remember this, but there was talk about the death of, of development economics, notably by Albert Hirschman. But I think the pessimists were clearly got it wrong, judging by the caliber of economists that development economics has attracted over the last 40 years or so, and the interests of uh, students, um, you know, worldwide, uh, such as yourselves, to students now I'm talking, uh, studying at uh, UNAM. So development economics is alive and well, I would say, and to, you, to the students, I, I hope uh, you will continue to, uh, to study it. Okay. Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't finished yet. Yeah. I haven't finished yet. I need to go. No. There we are. Oh, it's gone. There's my final slide. I wish all you students every success in your studies and future careers. And um, again, many congratulations to Investigation Economica on its 80th birthday. And there's a champagne bottle there. So drink to the, to the future of the, the journal. And its editor, uh, Ignacio. Thank you very much. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we are starting the questions and our comments from participants. If you have any question, you can raise your hand or write a statement at the chat. Anyone want to quest, uh, comment something to Tony? Well. Yeah. Dear Hideo, uh, can we get back to the overall uh, screen, please? Um, yes. May I? Um, I've got sure. to stop. I've got yeah. to stop sharing somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, um, because we are now going to Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's um, the reason why. You, the, I'm, we, I'm trying to find out who, how to stop sharing. Um, yeah, there, there's an option for stop sharing on top yeah, of, your, of your. I'm, of your I'm trying to scroll up, but I can't scroll up. Oh yes, uh, here we are. No. You got it. No. Yes, it, we, it, it must be on, the, on, on top of your screen, perhaps. Button? That's okay. I've done it. I've stopped. Yeah, okay, it's all right. It. Okay, thank Stop. you. So, Heidi, may, may I uh, intervene? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, so, well, uh, to begin with, uh, congratulations, Tony, on such a wonderful uh, uh, talk, such a wonderful presentation, very enlightening, uh, of course. And uh, I have a couple of questions, but before going into these questions, I would like to thank you for also for, 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 for an idea that you just gave me as you commented on your anecdote with uh, the, the, the copy of uh, uh, Arthur Lewis's paper. I mean, the thing that, that, that uh, you, you ask your students to, to pay you a pound, uh, uh, by letting them touch it. So I just want to say that uh, I have with me a copy of your book, you know, Economics of Development, that you gave me long ago. And there is inside, you know, uh, written a note 
uh, from you, you, you when you gave me this copy. So the idea that you just gave me is that I'm now I'm going to ask <laughs> my students to pay me okay. money for touching this copy. Thank you very okay. much. That's a great yeah. idea. Let, let me know how much you get. <laughs> I'll share part of it with you. Okay. So my first question. Uh, well, most likely, uh, Nichols Caldo and Lewis uh, uh, overlapped in, at LSE in, in, back in the 1930s because yes. they both were around at LSE in those times. Uh, could you give us a sense as to how they interacted, whether they interacted at all, and what sort of uh, influence uh, can be derived from Lewis's model on Caldo's idea of a structural explanation of development economics, which Caldo, you know, uh, 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 produced uh, later on in, in the 1960s as he turned to applied uh, uh, growth economics. Mm -hmm. That's the first question. And the second question, uh, it was a long held the idea that uh, uh, the dual economy model by Lewis was just uh, relevant for less developed countries. But incidentally, uh, in the few, last few years, some books have been published by people such as Peter Teming and Lance Taylor, speaking of a dual economy uh, phenomenon in most developed countries, in particular in the United States. There seem to be signs of a dual economy as you know, these uh, uh, countries are now experiencing polarization in income distribution and the decline of manufacturing. What is your take of that? Can you give us a sense as to these sort of uh, problems? Thank you. All right, so to go to your first question on the relationship between Arthur Lewis and uh, Nicholas Caldor in the 1930s uh, at the LSE, uh, there was no interaction of any significance as far as I, I, I know. I don't think you'll find any correspondence between them, for example, in the Caldor archives in King's College, um, Cambridge. And I think the reason is this, that uh, basically Caldor in the, th in the 30s uh, wasn't interested in applied economics. All his, all his papers, or virtually all his papers, are in, uh, in pure theory. Whereas uh, Arthur Lewis, he was concerned uh, with two things, I think. First of all, he was concerned with, the, I may be wrong on this, but one thing he was concerned with was the, 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 the pricing policy of public utilities. Uh, but the second, and, and perhaps more important, he was um, much concerned with economic history. And I don't know whether, I don't, can't remember the title of the book that he, but there was a, a book that he published on the economic history of the previous uh, 100 years and looking at the relationship between trade, for example, and, uh, and economic growth. So the answer to your question is, uh, no, there was no relationship between them in the 1930s uh, as, 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 far, as far as I know because they were interested in, uh, in, 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 in different things. On the question of dual economies uh, in uh, developed countries, I think the, the term dualism does come from the literature on, uh, on economic development and uh, you know, other e economists and, th and, th and th theories have latched onto the idea, particularly of dual labor markets. And, you know, as long as you have um, uh, 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 like a division between those who are in work, earning good uh, money, and those who are out of work or in very low paid jobs, you have um, a dual uh, structure there, and almost, uh, you know, a reserve army <laughs> of, uh, uh, of labor on uh, unemployed or, or, or low wages, which if there is a, a buoyant uh, industrial sector or, or, or a government sector, can absorb them 
at a, at a very low uh, wage. So I think with the 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 increasing uh, uh, income disparities that we witnessed in some developed countries in the uh, in the last uh, decades or so, and the existence of uh, uh, heavy heavy unemployment, you can apply yes uh, dual labour market theory from developing countries to to uh, developed countries as as well. You know, I'm not familiar with the book by um, the authors you mentioned, Lance Taylor and, and someone, but uh, I think I think you're 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 right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, participation? Can I? Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. The first, uh, in the first part of your presentation, you spoke about uh, global inequality, international inequality, and how uh, somehow it's been increasing. And there is a paper of Angus Ditton at the, in the 2021, the very beginning, that uh, he spoke about uh, how uh, global inequality didn't increase because of the pandemic. Uh, against to all the beliefs uh, that uh, we thought that the very uh, what the beginning of the uh, COVID crisis. So I just wanted to hear uh, about your opinion on that. Uh, this is the first one. And the second, uh, what happened with economies uh, like the UK or uh, the uh, Nordic countries that are uh, service based? Um, if the motor of the economic growth is the manufacturing sector, the UK economy is 80% of services. So uh, how do we explain uh, uh, the situation? Thank you. Yes. Um, when you talked about Angus Deaton and inequality, are, are you talking about um, international inequality or global? Uh, so the, the thing is that uh, he makes it a bit uh, when he's writing the paper, but I think he how he measure it is global inequality. Global. So he's concerned with income distribution within countries, as well as between countries, exactly. or just within countries. It's, uh, well, across countries, he says for sure uh, within countries there exists inequality, increasing inequality, yeah. but across countries, uh, might not. Okay, well, no, I don't know the, uh, the paper, and I don't know whether he's uh, right or whether he's, uh, he's wrong. And uh, again, it depends on how you're measuring the, the inequality as, uh, as well. I don't think anyone really knows what the, even the short term, let alone the long term, impact of the pandemic is going to, to be for, for, for countries. Uh, I think everything is really uncertain, depending on the success of vaccination schemes in, in various countries, whether new variants of the, the, the COVID uh, appear. Um, how countries uh, cope with the, 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 the pandemic and the, the different groups in society and the, the spatial distribution of the vaccination programs and so on. So, you know, I know there's a lot of ongoing work on this topic, but I, I haven't looked at this uh, myself, so I, I honestly uh, don't know. Can you re remind me where the, the paper is by Deaton? So the, the title uh, is called uh, COVID-19 and Global Income Inequality. It's published by the IFS, the International Fiscal Studies. Okay, yeah. Oh, well, if I get a chance, I, I may have a look at it, but I'm sorry, I, I can't answer your, your, your question. I mean, are you convinced by his argument or, or not? 
Oh, not really. Well, I don't know. I mean, not really. I mean, my, my uh, initial idea uh, is that there is an increase in inequality, but uh, but it's, he seems to show the opposite. That's why I wanted to mm. hear yeah. your view because. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that. On the, on the question of uh, services, as you know, services are very di di diverse. I mean, they, they ra range from sophisticated uh, financial services to very uh, menial uh, services, uh, both in developing countries and in uh, and developed countries. In developed countries, we call uh, these services or people who, who work in them the, the gig economy. Do you, do you are familiar with that phrase? Yes. Yeah, the gig yeah, yeah. E economy and... Uh, you know, there's a, a growing pool of workers in the uh, gig economy because they can't get jobs in the, 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 the formal sector. And one of the reasons why I think that productivity growth has slowed down in the United Kingdom, I mean, people keep asking this question, you know, why has productivity growth slowed down? I think it is partly because of structural uh, change. There's been a a shift, particularly out of uh, highly paid uh, government civil service jobs into um, people working in the gig economy where the, the pay, the, the productivity, which is measured by pay in the service sector is much, much lower. So if you were to adjust for the amount of structural change that there's uh, been, you might not find that there's been any slow down of productivity at all. It's all due to the shift from the higher paid, high productivity um, economy to, to uh, workers who were earning very much less in the, in, the, in the gig economy. So, you know, there's a pool of labor there yeah. uh, as, as there is in developing countries. And, you know, we, we, Arthur Lewis made this point very, very strongly in his 1954 paper that when he's talking about um, the indigenous subsistence sector, he's not only talking about agriculture, but he's also talking about the petty service sector. Because mm. if people get released from agriculture and they can't get jobs in the, in the formal sector, uh, by default, they, they have to earn a living in the petty service sector. And that, that's how it is. Uh, in, uh, well, you're, you're more than familiar with that in are you speaking from Mexico or somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I'm from Mexico, but I'm in the UK. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you're from Bath. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. But you, 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 you're, you're, you're familiar with what I'm talking about in the context of Mexico. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, someone else raised his hand, so uh, I think. Uh, Someone by the name of uh, Guillermo, perhaps, uh, as far I, as I, I can see. Yeah. I, I can't seem to, to, to get the, the event on screen anymore. Oh. I can't, see any, I can't see anybody. Oh. So. That must be a technical problem um, on your side, perhaps. Yeah, I can't seem to get rid of the... Perhaps, the, Professor... The, Appear well at the top of your screen. Yeah, we appear no. just on the top. No. Can you see us up top and top no. or on the side, perhaps no. on your right hand side? Yeah. Penny, right uh, Penny is going to uh, come and help me. Okay, she's um, a wizard on this. Oh, there we are. Well, how did you get that? Well, new technologies are tricky, Tony. So, uh, yeah, I'm. So there is Guillermo Noel who raised his hand. Can you go ahead, please? Go ahead and ask, raise your question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, well, I have one comment and one question. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So 
regarding the last comment uh, that was made uh, in the inequality that was not behaving as expected in the COVID um, pandemic, I, I once, well, just as a comment, I once uh, read something about it that um, the movement uh, of the population away from the cities created some sort of redistribution of the spending that could be showing less inequality in some uh, less uh, income sections of those countries. And, and, and since this movement was uh, worldwide, um, some regions of, of, of countries were um, they were actually living by waves of, of probably um, vacations or, or just from mm -hmm, tourist-based um, uh, towns. They actually received a lot of, of, of income from those uh, groups of people that move away from cities. And, and that could be part of the explanation of why the, the inequality that was expected to rise didn't rose that much. Well, mm -hmm. that's just like a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. In in, uh, in India, there was a, a big exodus, wasn't there, from the cities into the into the countryside? But I don't know whether the COVID programs in India were re redirected then to the rural sector or or, or not. Is, is that what you're? Would you use India as an example? Or? Well, well, mainly um, Mexico and in the United States. Um, a lot of uh, little towns actually developed like never before. So mm. this is like, um, for example, uh, the towns around uh, Mexico City and Texas uh, have never been like, you can see actually uh, businesses grow like never before. Mm. Like <laughs> at, at least in the time that I've been living in those and, and the people that I live in there and the people who are actually making content about uh, how the progress of, of these uh, places are, are becoming more relevant now that we don't have or we don't need to live in cities mm -hmm. because of the technologies that allows us to work from distance. Um, I think that is one of the, mm -hmm. the reasons that inequality might not be as uh, bad as, as we thought it would be. And my, my question to you is, uh, wh what is your take on the, on the future that, well, the hypothesis of that, that the, the total amount of potential jobs that we could create in a, in a technology-based economy is going to be less and less uh, more, um, how, how to say it, um, it's going to demand more from really? the minds of people that we will be in a sort of way unable to participate equally in the search for a, mm -hmm. for a new job for, in the new industries. Mm -hmm. Well, there's always been this fear, hasn't there, throughout history that technological change is going to displace uh, labor and that the consequences then yeah, yeah. of technological change is going to be unemployment. But that fear has never, uh, never materialized so far. And the reason is that technical change um, generates its own, own, own jobs in a way that, for example, if there is product innovation, people want to buy uh, new products that are produced by technological uh, change. So demand, as it were, always seems to keep pace with whatever the, the rate of technical change is and preserves uh, full employment or, 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 or can. So I don't know what's gonna happen with uh, more and more use of uh, a, 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 I, 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 I don't think anybody knows, but I think there will be a change in attitudes towards work. I think if people feel that they can earn a decent standard of living and employers of labor uh, a, a, allow this, people will move from a five day week to a four day week, or they'll move from a, 
uh, 40-hour week to a 30-hour week, as Keynes was actually predicting in his uh, famous essay in 1930s, the economic possibilities of our grandchildren. I mean, he was wildly optimistic compared with the situation now, but it, it might not be wild optimism in 20 or 30 years, uh, years time. But uh, I think people who have become more productive, earn uh, more because of technological change, will always find ways to spend their income. And in spending their income, they will generate uh, employment, income and employment for, for other people. So that would be my Keynesian explanation <laughs> of why I'm not so, so, so pessimistic. But, uh, you know, who knows? The future is un uncertain. As, as Keynes always reminded us in the general theory, fundamental uncertainty. <laughs> Right. Yes, thank you very much. Right. Yeah, thank well, you. we are running short of time. So we have three, three more uh, uh, persons uh, in line waiting for raising their questions. Can we just, uh, you know, get them all? I mean, can we just uh, listen to all of your questions and you uh, will respond, uh, uh, Tony? Yes. Uh, uh, do you agree? Yes. So, yes. hi, Gerardo. Gerardo Angeles is there. Ah. So can you, uh, Gerardo is here. I know, so, uh, I know uh, uh, Gerardo very well. Yes, of course. So, Gerardo, can you can you uh, raise your question, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ignacio. And, very nice uh, to see you. Very nice to see you, Professor Thirwal. Uh, it's been a pleasure to to listen to your conference. Very interesting, as as always. And I send you my greetings from here and, and yes, your family great. from greetings Mexico. From yeah. Uh, just. Uh, well, before uh, raising my question, I just want to say that I I have a collection of books of, 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 of you in my shelf and some of you with your signature. The, the, actually, when I revised the signature, they are dated in 2008 and 2012, when, when you were in Mexico in Politecnico giving yeah, yeah, lectures. Yeah. So I, I might follow the advice as well to, to <laughs> ask my students as well. Uh, well, that's a very brief comment, and I'm very proud of having these books here in, in, in my shelf. Um, my, my question, very briefly, is um, specifically about wages in emerging economies like, like Mexico. Uh, after trade liberalization in, in countries like Mexico, our main, one of our main comparative advantage uh, was uh, low wages. Uh, and, and since then, it's, it has been very difficult to increase wages in, in economies like Mexico. Uh, according to the orthodox theory, uh, wages can increase only if uh, labor productivity increases as well, high by, uh, hand by hand. But the uh, labor productivity has increased as well very slow, and therefore wages are nearly flat over the last uh, few years. Uh, and, and therefore, um, Domestic demand remains low, and basically we, we base our growth in, in trade and not in, in domestic demand. No? So at, at some point, should emerging economies like Mexico should abandon that comparative advantage of low wages and move to, towards a policy of increasing wages, not only by, by labor productivity, but maybe by other policy measures. Uh, I mean, that, that would be my, my question. What, what do you think about that, uh, Professor Thirwal? What would be the, the behavior of, of, of wages in emerging economies like, like Mexico to increase demand, domestic demand, uh, and as well to increase productivity? I think productivity might be difficult to increase if, if wages don't increase first. So what would be your opinion about that? Uh, and, and nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. Can we get uh, Juan Alberto's question, please? Juan Alberto? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Tirwell, for your presentation. Professor Tirwell, uh, you tell us that uh, economic science has to be a uh, moral science. I think that uh, I agree with that. Um, but also economic science is very related to economic power um, groups uh, to class struggle. 
So uh, what do you think about the vitality bi bi uh, of the economic policies der derived by the uh, development theory? I mean, because always we have some kind of a struggle, right, uh, between the social classes. So is, uh, is possible to implement a, a political economy to reduce the inequality around the world? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan Alberto. Please, Benjamin, can you uh, intervene, please? Uh, to to microphone. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Risking uh, uh, to appear somehow uh, a amanuensis of uh, Professor Ross, but 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 I think. Uh, he deserves uh, a room, uh, a space in your wonderful uh, uh, appreciation of economic uh, development. Uh, I'd like to bring out to this, to this meeting that uh, uh, actually he was applauding a series of contribution, which uh, I quoted at the beginning, by me, uh, generated a stronger interactions between growth theory and development uh, theory. Why? Because uh, uh, he was happy because uh, these two uh, separate uh, fields until the end of the last uh, uh, century and millennium uh, they, they were growing apart, uh, diver, diverging in, instead of converging. And, and so, uh, because uh, these two fields were moving together in parallel in the direction which uh, was uh, uh, his main worry, uh, Professor Ross's uh, main worry, the searching for the fundamental determinants of comparative development. But uh, uh, at the same time, uh, across the five terms uh, he treats in the, in the last book, uh, he was complaining. He was complaining uh, because uh, uh, classical development theory or uh, the so-called by Paul Krugman, high development theory, uh, uh, was uh, continuing being neglected. Uh, neglected, obviously, by the mainstream. Uh, so uh, I beg uh, one word from you, uh, Professor uh, Thirwell. Uh, what is the current situation uh, uh, in this very moment? Uh, taking into account his book was published in uh, 2013. Uh, uh, do you think uh, development economics continues being neglected? Because uh, uh, finally, uh, recuperating uh, Ross on war, uh, he said, this is a puzzle. This approach has a lot to say about uh, why uh, poor countries are poor and what they need uh, to uh, 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 take the way out of under, under development. So a twofold question, if time uh, allows. Uh, uh, your opinion about uh, uh, this uh, neglected uh, uh, situation of uh, uh, classical development economics, as Ross uh, said. And second, uh, what do we need in Mexico to grow uh, and, and eventually uh, to escape uh, the traps uh, using Ross word? the traps of the underdevelopment in Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So please, Tony. Okay, so Can first you of reply? all, to Gerardo talking about uh, wages and productivity, but with all due respect to Gerardo, I think he's got the direction of causation wrong. It's not from wages to productivity, but it's from productivity to, to wages. You can't have an increase in the real wages of people without an increase in their, their productivity. So the, the challenge for, for any country where the real wage is, is low is for there to be an increase in, uh, in, 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 in productivity. You can't get... Um, more out of a pint bottle than a, than a pint. <laughs> to, uh, yeah, I mean, do, 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 I mean that's, for me, that's quite fundamental that the, the whole basis of living standards is the, the per capita output of people, their, their productivity. So, you know, as long as you've got um, uh, an economy where there's a, you know, a, a mass of surplus labor that all has to crowd into a petty service uh, sector, you're gonna have very, very low real wages. And uh, if the industrial sector can get uh, its labor uh, cheap, uh, the labor in the industrial sector will also get low wages until the surplus of labor uh, dry, dries up. So, but you mentioned something about uh, trade and uh, I mean the promise as I remember one of the promises of NAFTA was that uh, Mexican workers would benefit as a result of an increase in real wages and as you, you are implying I think this hasn't uh, this hasn't happened also of course according to uh, orthodox trade theory the Hexro-Lin theorem there should be a decrease in income inequality because a country like Mexico should be specializing in, uh, in uh, goods which uses its most abundant factor of production, which is labor. So the demand for unskilled labor should rise relative to, to skilled. And so the, the wage distribution should narrow, but that as far as I understand, uh, hasn't happened. And I think the reason why Hexerlin gets it wrong is because they don't, uh, it doesn't, the theorem doesn't take into account FDI and it doesn't uh, take account of third countries. So in terms of third countries, Mexico sort of gets squeezed uh, by uh, imports from China, which uh, you know, keeps wages uh, low. And FDI <coughs> raises the, the, the price of skilled labor, not, not unskilled labor, or, or, a lot of a lot of skilled labor, so you get some sort you know contradictions I think between again what you observe on the ground and what theory uh, predicts. Uh, the second uh, question is that what was that from Guillermo? Or, uh, Juan Alberto. Alberto, sorry, Alberto. Alberto. Um, he talked about the class struggle. Um, well, what is the class struggle? The struggle between workers and, uh, and capitalists, uh, trade unions and uh, the bosses of companies. I think um, in, in, in most developed countries, we don't talk very much about a, a class struggle um, anymore, certainly not in, in Marxian terms where there, there's gonna be some sort of uh, social revolution by, by workers against the attempts to uh, reduce wages, for example, by capitalists to keep their profits up, which we did witness in the 1920s in, in the UK with the miners' strike, where the, the, you know, the, miner, uh, the, uh, the, the private owners of the mines uh, tried to cut the real wages of miners to keep themselves in, in business. But trade unions now in the, in the UK are very weak. They were weakened by the Thatcher government. Uh, they were outside the law and have been brought into the law and probably not more than about 10 to 15% of workers now belong to, to trade unions. Uh, in, in the United States, it's probably about the, uh, the same. So 
I'm, I'm not sure what I can say about the, the class struggle, except that I don't uh, see it as a, at least a, as a universal phenomenon in the in the uh, in the in the world economy. But you see um, a lot of discontent, and the discontent is related to to poverty, as I said at the beginning of my uh, my talk. The the Arab Spring, for example, in Tunisia was. Uh, was uh, lighted by, by, by yes, uh, revolt by, by, by unemployed youth. Um, to Benjamin, I would say, um, what I would like to highlight is uh, the, the difference between economic development and economic growth. That um, I don't think that development is possible uh, in even in Senian terms, without uh, 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 growth, but you can certainly have growth without development for the reasons that indeed Sen mentions that you can have fast growth, but the fruits of that growth do not accrue uh, in, in any widespread fashion ac across the uh, uh, the economy. <clears throat> but uh, Caldor, Lewis, and others they all drew on classical theory uh, for their own uh, thinking. I mean, certainly for, 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 for Lewis, uh, Marx's reserve army of unemployed is performing the same role in the, in the Lewis model as it does in, uh, in Marx's uh, model of uh, growth and then ultimate collapse. Um, uh, Caldor knew his Smith and argued that uh, he thought that economics had gone wrong after book four of, cha of uh, chapter four of book one of the wealth of nations where Smith abandoned the assumption of increasing returns in industry and reverted to the constant returns so that the foundations for uh, equilibrium theory were, 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 were laid. So yes I mean I have um, very high regard for, for Ross but I don't think that uh, development, as I said at the end, is is dead far far from it. I think there's more interest in development economics now than there has been for a very long uh, time, for for obvious reasons that um, we live in a very divided world. Um, a lot of negative externalities associated with uh, underdevelopment and, and poverty, and we we all suffer as a as a result. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony, uh, for 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 re reply. And uh, now we are running out of time. So uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, today's presentation comes to a close. And and of course, uh, once again, uh, we want to thank you uh, a lot for uh, such a wonderful contribution to our seminar and to the celebration of the 18th anniversary of Investigación Económica. And we are looking forward to seeing you uh, in Mexico at some point in the future uh, as we overcome the pandemic. Yes. Uh, hopefully we can you know, have a chance to invite you to, to, to visit uh, UNAM once again and uh, uh, contribute to, uh, personally to another uh, uh, mm. seminar. You know. So uh, I think uh, uh, this is this is it for today. I don't know whether ben Benjamin wants to add something, but on my mm -hmm. side, uh, I, I am really grateful to uh, for your contribution, Tony, and and I, I also uh, wish you uh, uh, the best of luck possible, and uh, uh, stay stay well, stay in good health, you and your family. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Benjamin, do you want to some yeah. say something? Yes, I'd like to add up uh, that uh, uh, we already confess in the same way like you. Uh, we are quite inspired by uh, great uh, past macroeconomist economist. Uh, 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 I like to quote, for instance, Shanghai Lal. Uh, I think uh, you know uh, about yeah. him, yeah. even when 
uh, he, he used to do the main work in, in, in the USA. Uh, Bayajet Singh, 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 yeah. Singh uh, who you quoted already. Hans Singer, uh, Lewis, obviously, because uh, the attractiveness of uh, the, 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 the model, the development model. But also, we are uh, uh, familiarized with the work done by uh, Hayu Shang, for instance. Yes. Also by uh, Jose Gabriel Palma. Yes. Cambridge uh, uh, professor. And obviously, by you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but uh, in all my interventions, I like to add up uh, Jaime Ross. I'm afraid I didn't explain uh, properly myself, but uh, uh, I will write you to put forward what exactly uh, uh, Jaime Ross uh, says in uh, the, the book, Rethinking Economic Development and Institutions. Many thanks mm. for the same reasons, Professor Perrotini Hernandez mm. uh, uh, said. Thank you very okay. much. Thank and you, also, Benjamin. Thank you. And, and also thanks for all the participants. You know, I mean, uh, Tony, you spoke to almost 200 people at some point, and uh, I think it was very fruitful for all of us. You know? So thank you all. Thank you all for, 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 for coming, for attending this conference, and, uh, and we'll, we will keep it up, okay? Thank yes. you. Thank, Bye thank now. you for the you presentation, keep... and the people are, Waiting for how can I say an applause. Uh, applause. Yeah. Yes. Perhaps Tony, Tony, perhaps you want to say something, Tony? No, uh, just to keep uh, just to keep safe. Keep <laughs> safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, likewise. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you Thank for the presentation. We'll, okay. we'll see you Bye, again. We'll see. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Felicidades, Ignacio. Felicidades, Benjamin. I, I can now have my I can now have my dinner. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right. Gracias, Francisco. Right. Bon appetit. Saludos. Gracias. Okay. Gracias. Bye now. Gracias. Bye. Saludos a todos. Adiós. Adiós. Adiós, Oliver. Adiós, Oliver. Bye. Adiós.